Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Seibel and welcome to DrSeibel.com. Today I want to talk to you about something really important, something that's very unspoken of, but something that's on the minds of so many people, and that is difficulties with sex or sexual dysfunction. You know, it turns out that about 70% of couples are going to have at some point in their relationship some kind of a difficult window of time with sexuality and with sexual function. Usually that's going to pass away and that's very normal. About 40% of women are going to complain of sexual difficulties in a rather ongoing way, but not something that's totally disruptive in their life. About 10 to 15 percent of women are going to have sexual problems that are going to be a significant problem for them in an ongoing way. And I want to address an overview that will at least talk to all of these things so that you'll have some idea about what to look for and when to ask for help and some of the simple things that you can do to help it be better. First of all, what is sexual function? What is it and what is sexual dysfunction? Well, this is the way it's divided up. In the medical community, it basically falls into categories. There can be difficulty with painful intercourse. This is one area. That's called dyspareunia. It can be difficulty with having desire. In other words, just not interested. So lack of desire. Another one is called lack of arousal. You might be interested but you just don't get excited. That's lack of arousal. And finally, the fourth category is anorgasmia or lack of orgasm. So those are basically the categories. So I want to talk to you about those because uh, when you go in and you talk about this with your doctor, and I hope that if you're having this problem you will talk with your doctor because they don't read your minds and it's very important you, ex you tell them about it so they can help you. It's helpful if you explain it in this way because then they understand the parts that they need to work on and can help you themselves or get you to the right person who can help you. And there's a lot that can be done. First of all, for problems that have to do with pain or dyspareunia, one of the most common is vaginal dryness. And this is so common and so important a topic, I've actually got a whole other video on that. I'm not going to talk about it here except to say there are things to do about that that will help you. So talk about that and it's one of the most common things that women come in and talk to me about and that's why I'm putting that as a separate issue uh, for you on a separate uh, DVD, separate video. Uh, there can be other kinds of problems too because there can be pain due to uh, an infection, there can be pain due to some uh, anatomical problem, there can be pain due to some other problem inside the body that's not in the vagina but is felt in the vagina. So these are things that require going to the doctor, having an exam and look about it and having them look at it because they can examine the outside of the lips of the vagina, they can look inside and measure the acidity of the vagina if it's alkaline or acid because this is something that can cause problems. They can look at the bacteria that are normally in the vagina and see if they are an inflammation in there or not. And they can also look at the glands that secrete to the vagina. They can do an exam, an internal exam, and they can then feel are there lumps or bumps or other things going on that are very important to know about. So that requires an exam without question. Go and get seen and then you will get information to help you potentially tremendously and in a very short time. There's another condition to do with this area that's called vaginismus and that's a situation where the vagina actually tries to close and not let the man enter. This is a specific area and if that's a problem also talk with your doctor because that requires an entire discussion that we can talk about in a different setting or in a different video at a, day, a different date. But I want to just acknowledge that because it's something that you should recognize happens to a lot of people. And the good thing about that, it's often very curable and all it takes is a little bit of information and you can get rid of that problem. Now. The problems of lack of arousal and lack of, of uh, desire 
often fit together under an umbrella, although they are different. But let me tell you some of the things that really matter here. You know, today people are very distracted. Everyone's working. Some people are working two jobs. They're very tired. So there's fatigue and no one is that excited when they're really tired. Be aware of that. That's very important. And sometimes just going to bed earlier for a few days can improve the whole situation and getting more rest. That's something to really work on think about. Another thing has to do with stress. You know, this generation is often, particularly the women, are called the sandwich generation because they're often involved in the care of their parents who are older and the care of the children who are younger. And you all know that just because the kids are no longer little doesn't mean they exactly go away. And even if they go off to college, sometimes they come back, right? So the thing is, is that women as have been called by my colleague Aileen Zolbrod, who's a sex therapist. She says, women are like crockpots and men are like microwaves. So women have to, uh, are much slower. They take more time to, be, to uh, become aroused. And as a result, what happens is if they're on the way to arousal and suddenly they start to think about the fact that they have not made the brownies for the, house, for the high school graduation or they start to think about that they uh, have a project due the next day or they think about they have to take their mother to the doctor the following morning, any of these other kinds of things that are normal life things happen all the time. What happens is they went from like 80% aroused and ready back down to 50% and now they have to start all over again. So it's important to be aware that it takes time and it also takes communication. Another important thing to realize is that there are so many medications that can dampen a woman's sexual drive. Some of the most common are antidepressants. Of course, people who are depressed may not be as amorous as those who aren't. But in the process of treating the depression, it's possible to have a side effect of having a reduced libido. So these are things to talk about with your doctor because it may be possible to change that. Some women, as they're transitioning, may be on a birth control pill or some other kind of estrogen-progesterone combination that's uh, used, and sometimes those medications can also cause a lack of libido. So be aware of that. Be mindful of that. The medicines that you're taking, there's also anti-seizure medications. There's a whole lot of medications that impact on libido. So make sure you have a complete list of those things. Another thing is just anxiety. A person could be very anxious for a variety of things. It could be that they had a bad sexual experience earlier and it's haunting them. For instance, it could be possible that a woman was sexually assaulted and it's not so unlikely because it turns out that in America one in four women has been sexually assaulted terrible information to have to share with you, but I say it because I want you to know that if it happened, number one, you're not alone, and number two, it could be having an effect as you think about that with the person you're with. Even though this isn't the person that did it, it could still have a lingering effect. So keep that in mind and keep, be aware of it because that's something you can talk about and you can, you can talk through. Uh, other areas to think about also are the fact that people can be distracted for a variety of other reasons and the medications are out there to help and also there's different kinds of therapy that's out there. Um, finally, I want to talk to you about orgasm or anorgasmia. The good thing about this is that with anorgasmia, often it can be treated. A lot of times, it's just a matter of not enough stimulation or not long enough stimulation. So a lot of the times, it's really talking with your partner and communicating or explaining to your partner what feels good so that they'll do that and help you because partners can't read minds. And if you can convey the information that's important to you, or even make some noise if your partner touches an area or does something that feels particularly good, convey that information so that it's possible for them to continue doing it and repeat it. Or perhaps you're in the middle of something that was really feeling good and suddenly they go off and do something else. Well, they may think that that's good for you, but you don't and you're the one that matters. So what you can do and not be in any way upsetting to your partner say, you know, I really liked what you were doing just a moment ago. Could you go back and do that again? It felt so good. So you can direct them and help them to help you. So 
I hope that this information has been helpful to you. Realize, number one, that sexual difficulty is very common. At least the majority of people, 70% have some problem at some time. 40% of women are having it, as an, it off and on as an ongoing thing. And 15% of women, this is a continuous problem. Realize that there are things that can be done. There's sexual therapy, there's medications, there's adjusting the existing medications you're taking, there's uh, relationship counseling where you can talk about that and you can see if there's any issues that you can do something about. Usually there are. If you leave your name and your email address, I'd like to continue to update you with our newsletter with ongoing videos and content that will, will be helpful on this topic and related topics that I think will serve you well. And always remember, it's better to stay well than to get well.